We are live, everyone. So welcome in on our fifth of six broadcast today. We are just blasting out with all sorts of really amazing content from all around the globe today. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So if you're joining us for the first time, and we do have a teacher joining us live on camera for the first time, welcome in. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms and homes around the world. Uh, we've been so thrilled over the last few months. I know classrooms are in session right now, but it's been so great to broadcast live to you on YouTube at home, Slido here, and more, featuring some really great scientists, explorers, and organizations across the globe. So with that said, I want to dive in with our speaker today, uh, a friend of mine joining us for the very first time. We are joined in Victoria, BC by Alana Wilcox. So she is a science communicator with a huge focus on conservation. She's done research all over the world on a huge variety of really amazing topics. But today she is going to focus on monarch butterflies, one of our most iconic species here, Canada, the US, Mexico, and more, uh, one of the most recognizable insects in the world, with a really, really cool story. But they're under threat. So Alana's going to walk us through a little bit about what's going on with that, how we can help, and a little bit more. And without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Alana, and take us away. Perfect. All right, so let's get this screen shared with you guys. Awesome. Perfect. Here we go. Uh, so hello, and thank you so much for tuning in today. This is really exciting. Um, so as Jesse mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about the conservation of the monarch butterfly. And again, like Jesse said, I am a science communicator. So I love getting out talking to the community and talking to people like you about just how cool nature is. But my day job over the last 10 years has been as a biologist and as a student exploring uh, various different animals and species at risk. So I looked at little brown bats on the Canadian prairies and went all the way up to Canada's Arctic. But over the last few years, I have been focusing on monarch butterflies. Now, here's the thing. I'm from Winnipeg, so I'm from the Canadian prairies, right where you see that gold dot on your screen. And in the bottom corner is the range of the monarch butterflies. So just within that yellow region. So not many monarch butterflies come from this area, only about 12%. So I never really grew up with a lot of monarchs around. And truthfully, when my supervisor asked me, Elena, do you want to study monarch butterflies? I said no. I, much like many of you, don't really like insects. But over the last few years, I learned some incredible things about the insects that we have in our world, and especially how unique monarch butterflies are. So here we have a picture of this gorgeous species, uh, the monarch butterfly. And on the left-hand side of your screen, you see the animation of the monarch migration. So right through the middle, eventually as this map fills out, you'll see a bit of a break. So on the west coast, uh, we have one population uh, principally in California. And in that huge chunk on the east coast is our eastern population of monarchs. And this is the group of monarch butterflies that I got to study and learn so much about. Now this migration puts the monarchs right up north into the northern US and southern Canada. And this is where the monarchs will spend their time breeding and laying eggs. Um, so just within these regions highlighted on the map and the most of them being in that northern area. Now female monarch butterflies will lay their eggs on milkweed. And within about three to five days, a tiny little caterpillar will emerge and they'll consume that egg casing, they'll consume the leaf, um, and milkweed is incredibly important for our monarchs. The caterpillars grow up on this, consuming so much of that leaf matter. In fact, over that two weeks of development, they'll go through five different molts and gain about 2,000 times their mass, eventually forming uh, that green chrysalid, a cocoon, uh, that you see in the bottom corner of your screen and eventually will emerge an adult monarch butterfly that will survive for about four weeks. But something really unique happens in fall. We get what's called a migratory generation of monarch butterflies. Now these butterflies have longer wings, they have more muscle, and they live a lot longer than that reproductive generation. In fact, they'll live for up to nine months. 
So this migratory group of butterflies will fly from all these regions in Canada and the US all the way down to the Oyamel fir forest in Mexico, where quite literally the trees are made of butterflies. It's an absolutely gorgeous sight. But to get there, these monarchs do something quite interesting. So like you or I, uh, monarchs have some internal clocks. So for us, our internal clocks will tell us when to eat breakfast and when to go to bed. But monarchs have a special internal clock that tells them what direction to fly all the way to Mexico. And this is to head in that southward direction. And monarchs do this by understanding or seeing where the sun is in the sky. But as you and I know, the sun will move throughout the sky during the day. So if the sun is in the western part of the sky, the monarchs know to veer left and continue south towards Mexico. And once our monarchs from this eastern population get to Mexico, we get the best idea of just how many monarch butterflies there are. Now we see some variation between years, but overall over the last few decades, we have seen a steady decline in the monarch population. And unfortunately, we also saw a decline this past year uh, compared to the year previous. Now, there are many reasons why monarch butterflies are being threatened or many threats to monarchs. And these include things such as climate change and forest loss uh, and even milkweed loss up here in Canada and in the US. It could also include things such as predation that you see in the top left or diseases um, in these other panels on top. Chemicals that we use within our yards or within agriculture can also affect monarch butterflies. But we don't, know, um, we don't know the contribution that each of these threats play to the decline of monarchs. So whether one threat affects the monarchs more than another. Now, I grew up reading and I love reading probably like many of you. And for this project, I got to read 150 scientific articles. So these articles are stories about how science is done and what scientists learn. And after I went through 150 of these stories, I sorted them based upon the threat and based upon uh, whether these threats affected monarchs and will be likely to affect monarchs into the future. And what we ended up finding was that three threats stood out. The threat from climate change, forest loss in Mexico, and milkweed loss in North America, so in Canada and the US, appear to be some of the biggest threats to monarchs and will be likely affecting them into the future. But for the purpose of the rest of my work during my PhD, I was interested in looking at an environmental threat that we don't know a lot about, at least in terms of monarch butterflies, and that is the threat from chemical contaminants. Now, I was specifically looking at a chemical in the family of the neonicotinoids. So these neonics um, affect many different animals that you can see here. So from bees and other pollinators, all the way up to birds. Um, and I was interested in seeing whether this chemical or a chemical in this family affects monarchs as they grow up, it affects their eggs laying, or whether it affects their migration. Now, in order to do this, we had to go through a number of different steps. And the first step was to catch butterflies. Now, as you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of monarchs around. So I hired a couple of assistants to help me out. So if you've grown up catching butterflies, you would be perfect to help with this work. So this is one of my assistants out there in a field on a farmland collecting butterflies so that we can bring them back to the lab. And once we got them to the lab, we fed them and we made sure that they were in overall good health to keep in captivity before re releasing them into the wild. Once in captivity, we were able to collect any of the eggs that the females laid. And these eggs were then transferred to milkweed that we grew in the lab over a few months. Now the milkweed that we grew was exposed or was treated with the chemical we were interested in. And over the period of time that the caterpillars grew up, we measured them and we took their weights to just see how well they were growing and whether they were healthy. 
And then eventually our monarchs eclosed. So they became adult monarch butterflies. And during that time we waited and we uh, were able to count the number of eggs that the butterfly, excuse me, that the female butterfly flies laid. Now we counted thousands of eggs. Uh, in fact, over 4,000 of them. So literally counting until our vision went blurry. And we tracked all of this data and tracked what happened. And what we found was that when the caterpillars are exposed to this chemical, they tend to produce smaller caterpillars or just not grow as big. Now, ultimately, we don't know yet what the impact of this is. So whether having a smaller caterpillar means they won't survive as well, we aren't entirely sure yet. So there's a lot, of more, a lot more work to do on this question. But we did find that despite early exposure to this chemical, adult monarch butterflies doesn't seem to affect their ability to lay eggs um, or the size of the egg. Now to continue on and look at whether this chemical had an effect on migration, we had to do that whole part of the first uh, end of that experiment again. So remember in fall, this is where we get that migratory generation, that really hardy group of butterflies that will fly down to Mexico. So we caught butterflies in the wild again, brought them back, collected the eggs and transferred them to milkweed in the lab that was treated with the chemical we were interested in. But this time, instead of measuring the butterflies as they grew up, we waited. We waited until they were adult butterflies. And at that point, we brought them back outside and we applied tiny little tags just to their belly. Now these tags will allow us or allowed us to track the monarchs during migration. And it does so by sending a tiny little ping that is received at radio towers um, as part of the MODIS telemetry system. Now this group of towers is spread throughout Canada and the US and many spots within the world and allows us to track animal migration. Now what we found over the first few weeks of the butterflies uh, during their migration was that all of our butterflies flew south. Now this was great considering that these uh, butterflies were raised exposed to that chemical. So it doesn't appear that at least at the doses that we were looking at, that this chemical seems to have an effect. So we're all good there, except there's another thing we have to consider. And that is that our monarchs were raised in captivity. So raising monarchs at home is a really, really popular activity. It can also be done for education purposes or for conservation, but there are a number of risks when raising butterflies at home. And this can include things such as uh, reduced diversity or an increase in disease risk. Now, last year, there was a publication or a story that went out um, that said that raising monarchs in captivity could affect their ability to fly south. So this would be a concern uh, if we are potentially raising butterflies at home or over multiple generations. Now, our studies within the lab agreed with this, that there could be an impact of raising butterflies or a negative impact of raising butterflies uh, in captive conditions. But we wanted to know whether releasing the butterflies back out into the wild could potentially uh, mean that the butterflies could figure out their way to continue to fly south. So we looked at this over a couple of years, and as you expect, we again found that our butterflies were still able to make their southward migration. So this is great news, especially if you want to raise butterflies um, at home. Now we think that this is because we're moving butterflies back out into the natural environment where they have sunlight. And as you'll remember from earlier in the presentation, sunlight is incredibly important for our monarchs to figure out their way to Mexico. Now, there are a number of things that you can do to help monarchs. You can consider uh, helping to save grasslands and protect the areas where monarchs and other pollinators live. You might also consider creating habitat of your own or planting pollinator gardens. So in that case, you can consider planting milkweed or planting wildflowers such as goldenrod or aster. For those of you in the US, you can consider checking out resources such as those from the Xerxes Society on different types of native plants that you can uh, find and plant within those gardens that are specific to your area. And we can look at native plant lists here as well in Canada. 
At home, you might consider limiting your pesticide use since we know that this can affect butterflies or affect the caterpillars as they develop. And of course, you can volunteer your time, get out with different organizations, help to count milkweed, see what habitat is available, and see how many monarchs there are on the landscape. And since we know that rearing our monarchs at home in captivity doesn't seem to be a risk once we are releasing our butterflies back into the wild, you can still um, do those activities. So you can still raise your monarchs at home and then release them back into the wild during fall to help on that migration. So thank you. So you guys can uh, keep in touch by all means. Fantastic, Alana, what a cool presentation. We've got people tuning in from uh, Minnesota, Connecticut, Ontario, and more. Really appreciate all the fantastic teachers. Some of our teachers have been raising monarch butterflies in their classrooms too, and so they're really vested in this, this program and highlighting it today. I'll give the slide a minute up on the screen for everyone to get some of these details. You can check out the site. I'll share it in the YouTube chat bar as well. I'll learn a little bit more about what Alana does. And then, yeah, Lana, uh, if you want to come out of it now, and then we can have a little bit of a chat, share some questions, that would be awesome. Uh, I'm going to go to Ms. Erickson in Stafford Springs, Connecticut, live with us. If you want to kick us off with a question, uh, Ms. Erickson, just demute your mic and go for it. Hi, absolutely. Thank you so much. So I have a few questions. Um, I have one from, let's see, where did it go? Sorry. <laughs> I have one from Natalie wanting to know how many years do monarch butterflies live and what do they eat and drink? Ah, okay. So monarchs, how long they live really changes on the type of monarch. So those monarchs that were laying eggs early in spring, they'll only live for about four weeks. But that monarch in fall will live up to about nine months. And that's really incredible. Or it's a very interesting difference within a single type of animal. In terms of what they're drinking or what they're eating, as a caterpillar, they're eating that milkweed. So that's why it's so important that we get milkweed uh, back planted and on the landscape. For our adult monarchs, they're eating nectar or drinking nectar. So having wildflowers available to them, much like other pollinators, is really important as well. Nice. Thanks, Alana. All right, let's go to Ms. Spencer joining us in Kitchener with her class. Uh, if you have a question for us, just demute your mic and go for it. Hi, Alana. Thank you. It's a great presentation. And we have several questions for you as well. The grade ones are very interested from St. Aloysius School. And Sally Ohm would like to know, why does the caterpillar eat its shell? Ah, okay. So there hasn't been a lot of work in, into that, but they likely eat their shell because there's some energy in there. So monarchs will kind of eat everything that's out there in terms of being on the, on the plant and on the milkweed. So they're likely just eating that because there's additional calories and things that can help them out. Uh, my favorite example of this in the sort of insect, so to speak, world is spiders uh, reabsorbing and eating their silk. Why waste the protein if you don't have to? Very cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's a great resource. So eat away. I love that you began this with this idea that you, you know, you weren't a bug fan and you've slowly been won over by how cool they are, as opposed to all our like all time lifelong bug nerds. Like this is fantastic. It's exactly what we're trying to, you know, sort of instill in people. So great job. Yeah, Anna. They're incredible animals and it's something that I really gained an appreciation for uh, and for insects in general over the last few years. Yeah I'm gonna ask at the end of this question so don't answer it now it's about cool resources to look up but uh, my own introduction to it was something called Life in the Undergrowth which is a BBC book and series. If you really want some really cool bug stuff Life in the Undergrowth amazing introduction can't recommend it enough. All right let's take some questions online so Miss Gary uh, joining us in Woodbury Minnesota she wants to know, she raises monarchs in the summer and uses little paper tags on their wings to track them. Is using electronic tags something that a lot of monarch organizations are doing? Um, not yet in terms of the electronic tags. So we were one of the first groups to, to get that out. We have some work that's done uh, with dragonflies as well. Um, so it's something that scientists are just getting, getting into. And the reason for that is that insects are super small and these tags are really heavy. Um, so it's hard to get that equipment down to a level that the monarchs can still fly well. Um, in terms of the paper tags, those are still used um, and are a great way to, to get involved in monarch research and to get involved in um, kind of science activities in general. So definitely keep that up. That's great to hear. 
Nice. All right, Ms. Ardelian's class uh, down the street from me here in Toronto, they want to know what are some of the predators of the monarch butterfly? Ooh, so there are a lot of things that prey on monarchs. Um, so monarchs, when they eat the milkweed, they start eating up this chemical as well, which is supposed to make them not taste very well to predators. Um, but they still have a lot of predators. And this can come from different types of insects, um, even ladybugs. So you saw one insect in uh, the photo that I had up. Um, and there are accounts for when they're down in Mexico that birds will even prey on adult monarchs. Um, so ants uh, as well. There's it's really almost anything, uh, which was quite a surprise to me, given that monarchs are trying to eat this chemical to ward off predators. Yeah, and they'll need to get some more and get like some cool technicolor stuff that'll really scare the predators away. So that's future monarch genetic engineering for you in advance. We'll cover that <laughs> in another program later. Um, all right, what I'm gonna do is go to Ms. Erickson's group for two questions in a row, Ms. Spencer's group for two questions in a row. We'll take some from YouTube just to keep it going. Uh, so Ms. Erickson, come on up and uh, share a couple with us. All right, thank you. So Talon would like to know, why is it that they go to Mexico? Like why not somewhere else? And do they, like, what is their body structure? She wants to know if they have bones. Uh, so monarchs don't have bones. So like many other insects, they just kind of have a harder body that helps to keep them, keep their structure or their body together. Uh, in terms of why they're going down to Mexico, why not? It's so warm. Up here in Canada, it gets super cold and the monarchs wouldn't be able to survive the winter. It just gets too cold. So they don't have uh, a very fuzzy exterior or a way uh, to protect themselves. So many of these monarchs or the majority from our, our population will head all the way down to Mexico. However, there is some question whether all of the monarchs are getting there. So it seems now that because milkweed um, can be grown year round in some of the southern states, some of the monarchs will stop there. And we're actually starting to see a resident population. So a group of monarchs that just stay in one place um, down in the southern US. But for the most part, over uh, the years that we've known about monarch butterflies, they're going to be heading kind of from those areas in Canada and the U.S. and making their way down south. Nice. All right. Uh, Ms. Erickson, second question for you. Come on up. Um, I had a student that wanted to know, um, basically, you know, talking about their wing structure. Can you talk a little bit about, not necessarily about why they fly, but like a little bit about their wing structure. Is it difficult for them to fly in the wind? Um, do they have obstacles in flying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, in terms of, I guess, actually be able, being able to fly. So monarchs appear to use the wind a little bit to help get them some lift and get them to their destination quicker. So we do know that some of those environmental factors can help them out. Um, in terms of the structure itself, uh, it's hard to say. I guess it depends on, on what you're asking. Okay. Tricky question, but I, I really like it. Uh, Lynn, if you have any follow-ups to that, by all means, share them uh, either later or throughout the presentation. Um, for now, Ms. Spencer, we'll come to you for a couple questions. Go for it. You can either do both in a row or one at a time or whatever you want. Just mute your mic and we're good to go. Um, so the grade ones in the class beside me, which is Mrs. Nadeau's class, they would like to know, how does a butterfly eat and taste? How does a butterfly eat? Well, so, oh, I wish I could go back and show you. So during the video that we are showing, they kind of had this little um, kind of stick coming out of their mouth. So that's essentially their mouth and how they're eating and slapping up nectar. So it's kind of like if you were sucking uh, through a straw. Uh, for our caterpillars though, they're eating, they have a little mouth parts at the start uh, or at their front, I guess, um, that can help chew those leaves um, and eat no different than your eye. Cool. cool. And then a second question, Ms. Spencer? Okay, and thank you. And Hayal would like to know, why do butterflies go into a pupa? Why do they go into the pupa? Well, that is a mystery, to be quite honest. Um, so we know that after those few weeks, those monarchs will form a chrysalid like 
many other butterflies and moths, um, but we don't know much about what is actually happening within that chrysalid, except for the fact that we know that their bodies are changing and will eventually make that adult butterfly. But why and how is a mystery to science. How cool is that? I love when we can play Stump the Scientist. And I mean, in general, actually, the questions both live and on YouTube have been really fantastic. So way to go to all our teachers. I, I'm really appreciating all this. Um, and yeah, if you ever get a chance to see a chrysalis in, in life, whether that's at a butterfly conservatory or just in the wild, it's a really, I mean, it's, I'm sure it is to you too, Lana. It's like black magic. I mean, it's the coolest thing. It's really interesting. And for the monarchs themselves, I mean, I'm biased, but I think they have a gorgeous chrysalid. I described it as a green chrysalid, but um, there's these little black spots on there and really little like bright gold details that just shimmer. It's so pretty. Nice. All right, before we go to some YouTube questions, uh, Micah wanted to know as a follow-up in Ms. Erickson's class, what is what makes their wings able to fly? Like, I, and whether you want to take that as like a a physics question or anything you can share on that, Atlanta? Like, is there something specific about them or insect wings in general that allows them to fly? Mm. Um, I can't speak too much about their wings. It's unfortunately just not the area that I, I had worked in. But I can tell you something that was kind of cool and that scientists are still figuring out. And that is how bright of orange or how dark of orange on the monarch wig. So how, um, how colored those wings are uh, can determine how well the monarchs fly. So there is some work on that, but we don't really know why yet. I love it. How neat is that? All right. Uh, our question from uh, Ms. Dewar, she wanted to know, have you ever been to the forest in Mexico to see the butterflies arrive during the migration? And if so, how would you describe the experience? I haven't. I am hoping though uh, to go at some point in the coming year. Um, I. Desperately would like to see it. I've heard incredible things um, of just how gorgeous it is. Well, if I may, uh, my one trip this year before COVID hit was to go to Mexico to see these monarchs. It's something I've wanted to do since I was a little kid. Um, so you ride a horse basically straight up a mountain for like an hour and a half and it's incredible and you get this big mountain meadow and uh, the days that I was there, there actually weren't as many as there can be and the sun didn't hit them. So they weren't flying around, but I saw videos of that. Just even seeing a forest with a million butterflies, like literally weighing down trees is wild, it's like black, mm -hmm. like magic. Um, and some of the videos of, of them flying around people, if you have 100,000 butterflies flying around you, it's a, an experience not to be missed. So I, I hope you get that chance, Alana, and uh, that's yeah. very cool. I've heard incredible things too, that when they're flying, you can literally hear them flapping. There's just so many of them. How neat is that? So there you go. For all our teachers and students watching live one day, get down to Mexico. It's an incredible experience. It's not too far away. All right, uh, Miss Gary wanted to know, when monarchs come back from Mexico, do they go back to the same places to lay their eggs? Are they like sea turtles in that way or not? Okay, so we really don't know how loyal monarchs are to where they go. But there's a special thing to consider here. And I kind of brushed over it a little bit in the presentation, and that is, that there are many different monarchs making this journey. So it's not just one monarch. So in the summer and spring, the monarchs up north, so in Canada, in the US, will actually have three different monarchs. And then that last monarch will fly all the way to Mexico, stays there over winter, and then in spring, moves a little bit further north, getting into the Texas area, where they lay their eggs and die. And then a new monarch will emerge uh, and then continue that journey northwards. And they go through, so they go through in total um, four generations. So between caterpillar to adult. So the reason we can't really say what one monarch is doing specifically is because it's not one monarch. So we don't have a way of tracking uh, that difference as they're migrating or where they are as they're migrating. This is such an informative presentation. I love it. Um, all right, we're going to take a couple more questions. Uh, Ms. Ardelia wants to know, what are the most dominant senses that monarchs have? Are they, are they smell priority? Or is it vision? Uh, how do they get around? Ooh, so for the most part, um, and this is, I didn't say this specifically, but I would say it would be based on kind of touch 
and just chemical sense. So we know our female monarchs um, will determine whether they're actually laying their eggs on milkweed um, by some special sensors they have on their legs um, that will tell them, yes, this chemical tells me this is milkweed and I can lay my eggs here. In terms of vision, not very good at all. Um, so yeah, on the landscape, oftentimes um, the males, when they're looking around for a mate, they actually don't know what they're really looking for. It's hard to distinguish a, a female monarch from a totally different animal, or I shouldn't say a different animal, but a different type of butterfly. Um, so it is really tricky for them to, to distinguish these differences. So I would say that it's more of that chemical sense and that touch sense that's really important for our monarchs. Nice. Well, Alana, again, this has been amazing. What I want to wrap up with is for people at home, for our two cheers that are live from all over Canada and the U.S., where can they go to learn more? So I've linked your website into the chat bar on YouTube. I will share with our teachers live on screen with us so that they can find out more about you and all the cool work you're doing. But if people are just like, they're, they're on to butterflies now, they're so pumped, where are some places we can send them? There are a ton of resources available and books at your library to check out. Um, for online, you can look at uh, groups like Monarch uh, Joint Venture or um, uh, Journey North. Uh, which will tell you a little bit more about the monarch migration, um, but tons of resources that are available. So definitely dig in. Nice. Alana, this has been fantastic. What we do at the end of every presentation, I know there's only two teachers with us, so it's a little <laughs> different than having 50 students, uh, but if Ms. Erickson, Ms. Spencer, if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to Alana for joining us today, along with that cacophony on YouTube, of course. So thank you so, so much. <laughs> thank you so much. This was thank awesome. Thank you. This it was, was awesome. Really great. This is our first okay. true monarch presentation I think we've ever done, and I, it's been way too long in the making. So, Alana, thank you again. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. For everyone tuning in on YouTube, we've got another monarch presentation actually happening next week. So, a cool follow-up to this if you're keen to learn more. Although, frankly, I'm not sure how much more we could learn. We sort of cut, Alana, you covered everything. We got, like, all the best questions in. So, really appreciate that uh, for everyone on YouTube. Check us out uh, again, and you can watch this video again on YouTube. It'll stay there. So if you want to hear back any of Atlanta's awesome answers, all there for you. For now, have a wonderful rest of your day, and bye, guys.